Good afternoon. I want to talk to you about a program that I have written. I started to write this program, oh, I think about five years ago. The program is called EasySync. Does anybody use it here? One, two, more. Oh. So there's a potential for a few customers. <laughs> okay. What I want to do is to tell you about the new version 3.0. But first, a little bit about synchronization. It sounds always simple, is it? You've got two devices that are connected to each other and somewhere or other you want to synchronize them. Sounds so simple. But like most things in life, it isn't so simple. Should a file be copied if it's updated? Well, yes, the newer file should be copied. But what if the other file was also updated? What do you do then? Then it's no longer so easy, is it? Unfortunately, you can't see this very well, but this is the synchronization settings page within uh, EasySync. And basically what you have is the ability for all situations to say what you want to do. For example, you say if the file name and size, date and time are the same, but the MD5 is different, what do you want to do? In this case, we would say, well, this is an anomaly. There, there's something strange. It's not something you can automatically decide on. So you want to flag it as an anomaly and later look at it yourself to say what should really happen. If you say that the target file was deleted after the last sync, you want to delete then the source file to keep them both in sync. And so you have all various things like if the file only exists at the source, then you want to transfer it. A file exists only at the target, and you're talking about a um, unidirectional transfer, not a bidirectional synchronization, you probably want to delete it. In this way, for all the situations which you can think of, you can select what is going to happen. simple. But even when you are controlling synchronization for a hundred percent yourself, you know what happens if something goes wrong. You make a mistake. You say, well, copy that file across and you say, that was the wrong one. Well, with EasySync we have um, what we call a vault. And that is basically a database on the drive that you're copying to. So you have a vault on every particular drive or system. And every time a file is overwritten or deleted, it is put in that vault. Every time. Which means that if you do another synchronization at a later date, the same file that has been updated would also be put into the vault, but as a separate version. So you can always find back all the files that you have ever overwritten or deleted. In principle, the number is unlimited, but in practice you will limit that to a certain number, such as 20, and after a while, if the 21st file is entered, the oldest is just removed. Ah, yes. Synchronization. Is it so simple? Well, you, unfortunately, I can't make this any bigger. But what you see here is the name of the file, the title, and you see one, two, three, four, five, six files all have the same name. This is the long file name problem that you can also sometimes get into. So 
this sort of problem also has to be taken care of when you're synchronizing. So we synchronize not on long file names, but on real file names. Yeah. <laughs> um, what about extended attributes? Well, I talked a lot about that this morning, but basically, yeah, all files are copied together with their extended attributes. But as we also said, not all file systems support extended attributes. And then you have a problem. Now, with 3.0, I've added a function which basically creates a database in the file system that does not directly support extended attributes. And the extended attributes are stored in that database. Um, why did I do this? Well, I have a NAS at home, which runs on Linux, and I can copy files to it and read it with Samba perfectly, but it doesn't handle extended attributes. So I thought, how can I get around this? Now, I know that in the Linux kernel, you can recompile such that it does, in fact, support extended attributes, but this is a NAS with firmware, which you can't really change anything. So I said, OK, I make a database. And that's one of the main differences with version 3.0. Um, to best do this, we say, well, I can enable EA file level support if necessary. If I switch it on for all drives, if it ever detects a drive that doesn't support EAs, it will automatically create this database. Now, it might be for some reason you don't want it to do that. So here you can change that ability. There's here the position where you can say the maximum number of copies per file. So this is where you say, I want to have 10 versions of a file or 1,000 or what have you. It just takes more disk space. One of the questions often is answered, yes, if I put my data on the cloud or anywhere else, is it safe? Everybody can see my data. So how about if I encrypt the data? With version 3.0, Zero, we need to kill something there. Um, I use an AES 256 encryption, encryption algorithm to store the data. In that way, nobody else, except maybe the NSA, will be able to see what I put somewhere in the cloud. As a double check, because I am always somebody who thinks the software that I write will probably have errors in them, I want to make sure if I encrypt something that I can decrypt it. Because <laughs> guaranteed, if I can't, I'll have lost the original. So we have within 3.0 a option to select verification after you've written the file encrypted, and it does this by doing the checksum. The MD5 checksum is also written in the encryption data, so that when you decrypt it, you can also check that that MD5 is what you get back. So it's a belt and braces. You make sure what you get back is what it originally was. Until now, it works. Here you can see a page which allows you to select drives which you want to encrypt or decrypt. Using the uh, uh, NetDrive plugins, you know you can connect to FTP sites and so on and so forth. So in that way, you can put data wherever you want. So with NetDrive, you select a particular drive 
for a particular FTP site, for example, and you say, OK, drive Z, I select, and all data that is sent to that drive will be encrypted. You can select an encryption key, which is here, you can see it, but you can also lock and hide the key. I've only used uh, three characters here just so I can remember them while I'm testing. Longer do work. On the same page, you have the verify after and encryption and after decryption. And that way, you can control writing files encrypted. Questions? Oh, it's still so warm, right? Maybe you say, well, the data that I am synchronizing may be in the form of a backup. You want to compromise that data. You want it to take up less space. That's also possible. So you can say, I want to compromise all files to a particular drive. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Compress. I'm getting, com I'm getting compromised here, yeah, right, yeah, sorry guys, it's, it's so warm. The NSA got to your The NSA got to me there. Anyway, sorry. So, and I've even written compressed and I'm talking something else. You can store compromised files. Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, if the files have been compromised, you should have encrypted them, right? So, you can also define a minimum size of compressing a file. As you know, most data to our hard drive goes in 4K blocks. So if you have a file of less than 4K, it doesn't matter if you make it only two bytes long, it still occupies 4K on the disk. This is on a file by file basis because when we're talking about synchronization, we are synchronizing on a file by file basis and not on directories or drives. Um, if you like, you can say, certain files I don't want to compress. For example, a JPEG it doesn't make any sense because JPEG already is a compression format. So you can say, forget those files to compress. Again, as I say, belt and braces, I like to be able to check that what I have written can be decompressed, and it's the same as what I originally had. So there is, again, a verification option. Of course, verification options are very nice, but they take up additional time and additional uh, resources. Because if you write something, you have to read it back. If this is over a network, obviously, that is going to take more time. But it, again, is, first of all, Try it, see if it works, and if you think it works perfectly, then switch off the verification. Oh, I've got a question here on IRC from uh, DBANet. I think he's from Russia. Yes. I'm not certain. And he says here, question to the presenter. There are lots of synchronization and backup solutions, including the free and open source rsync utility. Yes. There are also lots of backup, restore, and sync utilities built on top of it which are cross-platform, free and open source. So what's the point of writing your own? Uh, porting and adapting existing solutions will probably give more benefits as being mainstream on many operating systems, hence the larger uh, user and support base. Um, I will answer that question, although it is rather long. <laughs> so I have, to, I have to remember exactly which part. Uh, ba basically, yes, why this instead of, for example, R-Sync? R-Sync is available on Ecom Station. There are versions of, of R-Sync. If you prefer that, use it. But R-Sync does require that on the other device where you're synchronizing to, there is also R-Sync running. So if, for example, you have a NAS that does not support R-Sync, or supports a form of R-Sync that doesn't work, this is an alternative. What was the other part of the question? Um, yeah, so basically, the yeah. back end and the front end code, the graphical user interface, can both be ported. So is it not... Uh, 
when he also asks a second question, have you ever consider, considered freeing and open sourcing your software? If not, why? So why have you not open sourced your software? Uh, I'm very poor and want money. No, seriously, um, I will eventually open source my software when I'm a bit older. When I'm retired, as always, programmer. <laughs> Sorry about that. I wrote that, by the way. So yes. Me. Okay. Um, I haven't open sourced it, basically because I want to keep control of the software myself at this moment in time. Um, that way, I have a better feeling of exactly what is happening with the software. Um, if you open source stuff, then you also have to do a lot of work to make sure other people can read it so that they can, in fact, change the software and uh, modify it, improve it, but they need also the basic information from you. That costs me also time and energy. So at this moment in time, I have decided not to do that. Okay. Uh, there's, a, there's one more reason. Yes. To be proud of your own, own intellectual Yes. <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm proud of being able to write this. Um, it is, most of my programs that I have written have come basically from the need by myself to do something uh, because I have not found an alternative that works for me. That doesn't mean to say there are no better programs out there, uh, cheaper, open source, what have you, but what I have found doesn't quite fit um, my requirements. So I made this program basically for myself, listened to what other people have asked about. At the last warp stock, we talked about compression and encryption. So I've now incorporated that. I found, uh, of course, uh, during making this program, various uh, small errors. But, uh, for example, I discovered that um, extended attributes also exist on directories. And previously, when I synchronized a directory, I just created the new directory, but didn't take into account there might be extended attributes. But now I also copy them across. So, it's learning by doing What languages do you want? Yes, you've got it. it uh, the current version is in Swedish, Danish, German, French, poco italiano, and of course English. Um, I will come on later on that, but because of the question, um, in the future, I have decided for all of my programs... The user interface may be in multiple languages, but the help files will only be in English, German, and Dutch, because it's very difficult to maintain eight different languages, even with the Google Translate. <laughs> yeah? So the current version, as I said, has Danish, English, German, Dutch, French, English and the various help files as well. Oh, there's another question here from Martin Eaterby from OS2 World, and he's asking which which tools you use to develop the software. I basically use VCC, Visual, Visual Age, Age Compiler. Yes. Visual Age. Yeah, basically because I'm used to using it. Um, if I come upon limitations then I will switch to something else. But as long as it works, you know, it, it means it's quicker for me. To use a new compiler, there's always a certain le learning process which takes time and makes more mistakes. Which version? Do you use version C or 4? Uh, 3.0. The, the main difference is that with 4, you've got 32-bit uh, arithmetic in there. You've got a little bit of 32-bit in, uh, sorry, 64-bit, uh, no. A long, long, that's 32 bits, isn't it? Yeah. 
So uh, that's what I use. Where can I buy this program? <laughs> I'll come on to that. Uh, there's a minimum file size. There's not a maximum because what I do uh, is I write the compressed files in blocks so that I can make even bigger files because the compression algorithm I'm using only supports the, the standard, uh, what is it, uh, two, two gigabyte files. I haven't tried it yet but it should work. Okay, here you see the same uh, idea for the compression. You see you can switch compression on and you can select certain drives. What you also see is this, I don't know if any of you can see that at all, but this is disable this button. I have another question. From May I finish my question okay. for about this bit first? Uh, this is in fact the drive where the executable is. The executable cannot be on a compressed or encrypted drive because you need to run an encryption program on the encryption program which isn't loaded in memory. That's basically why that is, but that should not be a problem. The question. Again, one from uh, DBA Net. Um, I guess you, I already know your answer, but he asks, do you believe, Keith, that uh, the commercial OS2 market is still big enough for commercial proprietary applications to exist, to be maintained and supported, um, and that they can give a significant profit? Well, if I, talk, <laughs> if I talk about my own programs, it's very simple. The amount of money I make on these programs in no way, shape, or form gives me enough money to develop the programs as they are. I, it's basically a hobby, and I prefer to sell for a small price as a sort of reward for myself to feel that people appreciate it. Because I've learned in marketing one thing. If you give something away for free, then it has no value. If you give, or, or if you even give something away for free and you put a price on it, it's automatically got a value. Or you have to pay for it. Then it has value. That's the reason I do it. But is there a market for commercial OS2? Um, I think so, yes. But it depends again on your uh, organizational and uh, structure of your company. Does that answer the question? I haven't heard anything back, but it's an answer, so... Now there's a 15 second lag in the MP3 stream until somebody hears what you said, so... No it problem, it gives me a chance. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes, he says, thank you for your answer. Uh, next page. Oh, here you can see, uh, by the way, on the compression size, the minimum file size, and any files you want to add or make sure are not added as compressed and with the verification possibilities. Next page. I think the computer's got the 13 second lag now. Oh no, it's at the bottom here. Okay. Some other minor updates. Um, I've changed the way that you see a file being copied. The reason was originally you had in the um, area at the top of the screen it showed the file that was being transferred and then afterwards a percentage of the transfer now I've just added an additional uh, bar at the bottom underneath the bar which is the total time it's a little bit nicer um, there's an additional vault indicator Basically, what this icon is showing, that that particular drive requires support for extended attributes, and it is active. Here you see 
it should have had extended attribute support, but it doesn't, so no extended attributes go across to that drive. Where can you buy it? Well, you can buy it from Arc Noah, uh, together with other programs from me and from Mensis. Today, you can get a special discount. Come on, guys. Uh, thank you. <laughs> hey. No, that means approximately. <laughs> uh, we add the 50% on and then deduct it. You know that, how that works in business, right? Special sale, today only, 50% off. But we're 100% dearer than yesterday. No, but seriously. So you can order this program from me today for 20 euros. I will also give the same sort of discount to Search Plus and Sigma MD5. This summarizes uh, everything that is in version 3.0. As I say, it supports now EAs on file systems that do not directly, encrypts, compresses data. There is also a, a general verification option you can switch on. Uh, various bugs have been removed. Extra bugs have been introduced. Uh, as I said earlier, the help files will only be in Dutch, English and German, but the user interface supports Dutch, English, French, German, Italian, Spanish and Swedish. And I think I also have Danish, but we can check on that. Um, the pre-release, which I will put up on Hobbes with a little bit of luck next week, um, will be missing the following things. It will be missing the updated help file in all languages. So it's a little bit of, uh, oh, it's not so difficult. Use your head, look at the old help file, and you'll probably get it working without any problem at all. The user interface is currently only in Dutch, English, and German, so the other versions have to be introduced and if it's so warm here, that'll take a little bit longer. Now, first of all, I would like to do a small demo of the program so you can see it. For those of you who don't know it, so I will sit down. <sighs> Doesn't matter. <laughs> okay. So this is basically the screen of EasySync. I will make it a little bit bigger. So here you can say I want the source file or the source directory I should say. And here I will just to make sure that everything is correct use exactly the same one. Now what you see is that it says that there are no different files which I could just say select no different files. All files are the same, there are no missing files, newer files, or actionable files. Of course, this is a little bit strange. Normally you would not be doing a synchronization between exactly the same files, but just to prove how some things work. Um, this is the vault, and if I select it, you can then see all the various files which have been put into the vault. I can do such things as sort on the name, or I the most important one, I think, is the insertion date and time. So the last time that one of the files was put into the vault, you can select on only the last record, so it's always the very last version that went in there. If you select something, you can say, well, I can restore it, destroy it, or swap it with the existing file to the existing original place it was at. Uh, what is also helpful, you have a, a small search uh, window. 
And now I have to think of something that we actually might have. So immediately it searches to that place within the vault for this file or any file that appreciates with that number, sorry, that text. I can look for another one, but apparently there are no more. That's because I am only looking at the latest records. If I went to all the records, then probably we will see more versions of the same file, which I now don't see, which of course is the, the demo effect. But anyway, you can select files and you can search for files. Um, just a simple thing, you can also select on the files and you can see then their modification dates, size, their attributes. Uh, you can even <coughs> do a comparison with GFC if it is available. In this case, they are definitely the same files, but it's the same <laughs> file name. Let's go back out. Um, here, and I have to, because I played around with this, I have to make sure that I have uh, switched. You can't have an encrypted and a compressed drive at the same time, at this moment in time. It basically does work within the system, but there are a couple of bugs I want to remove before I make them available to you. Okay, save. Let's see. Okay. What you see here is, because I've said this drive is encrypted, automatically it gives an indication with this little, if you can see it, looks like a little lock. So these files are encrypted. And it indicates all the files that are encrypted. Now, what you can also see is that it says two of these files are different. So, if I do a transfer, hey, it says there's one anomaly and no errors. Now, if we go and have a look, what is the anomaly? It says to me that the source is older than the destination. So, I have to decide myself what to do. And that's because the last synchronization, I've been throwing stuff away and adding it and so on. But basically, you see we have an encrypted file. If I do this, I can directly do a comparison of an encrypted file and the original file with GFC. So it does an automatic decryption to allow you, if there are differences, to find them. The same function you have if it's a compressed file. Just to prove that it works. Of course, this works better if they are really separate machines. But as I don't have that here, I will go to... Now, here you see the compressed files and yeah it's a very simple command file but they are both the same I can and now I'm going out of the program hit the wrong button back in again that's the problem with the big close button oh no it was test wasn't it test I was using compress but let's have a look. Okay. Oh, yeah. Here's a little indication that it is a compressed file. Um, if I open up a window just to show you it really is compressed, the first file. <laughs> That's really compressed. <laughs> it's blank. <laughs> Maybe I've got a wrong one. Let's, let's cross-check it. Uh, no, it has a very large file size, but because the first character apparently throws out the uh, extended, the, uh, the editor, 
you don't see any data. I should, of course, done something else like uh, type. Uh, this four OS two, yeah. Oh, I know why it doesn't see it. I use a small trick. That's not the real name. Let me show you. That's why. That's why it didn't work. Now I'm realizing it. If I do. And we do this. Oh, uh, oh yeah. Test. Oh. Now, why isn't this working as I want it to do? Well, let's. Uh, oh, yes, of course, wrong. Form. I have to go to the complete directory. Uh, actually, the directory is compress. <laughs> you want more discount. And what you see is, or well you can't see it here, of course, but what I do is I add uh, for the compressed files dot huff afterwards. On the display, it is shown. If you ever open it, in another way, you will see that it is a compressed file. Um, let's see what else I can show you guys. Well, these are all the various pages. There's nothing special. Um, what you can also do is if you have decided that the synchronization that method I have chosen to work, I can say OK, I can save it as a script file. In that way you can say the type of file it's going to be. You can say what the file is, is, so you give it some form of description. Uh, you can then change a number of the variables that you have in the setup. Nine times out of ten, you will leave them as they are because you found that this works as it is. So, and then finalize it. What you did notice is that when you finalize it, you can choose either to automatically stop or not. So I will show that again because it probably went too quick. Yes, replace it. Yes, it's the same. Okay. I can say close then easy sync when it finishes. Finishes. So in that way, you can leave it unattended running or, or close the program even if there are errors. So you have a choice. Don't close the program at all. Don't close the program if there are errors or do close the program no matter what. So that way, you know if something went wrong. Every time that you run, the synchronization, a log file is created and tells you exactly what has happened. Questions? I'm using the uh, version uh, 2.0, yeah. And uh, have a couple of problems that if I start to synchronize the two, uh, yeah, two uh, slides, yeah. and I leave my office, yeah. Yes. Ah. Yeah. the first time I've heard of it, but um, whether that is to do with my program or the, just because the drive becomes available in the workplace shell crashes, I don't know. But I would like to have a discussion with you to have a look at that problem and see if we can solve it in any way. Yeah. Um, in, in principle, of course, um, if you're doing... A, Maybe I have to, uh, tell you that I'm using OS2 and not 
in principle, the, uh, this version should work with uh, all the versions of uh, OS2. Um, from, I think it was OS2 4.0, the long, uh, oh sorry, large file support was introduced. I think it was 4.0. I don't know if it was introduced slightly earlier. Um, and there was one major difference that if you used a program in which um, an API which addressed uh, large file support on an old system it gave a, a dramatic error. I solved that problem by adding a DLL and it looks to see if it's supported first. So it should work. Okay, as far as I know that, that, that then there is not that reason. So there's something else. No, but you have the support in the program so what he does is when he opens a file, it is a, does a DOS file open L, uh, which means that it can accommodate uh, the large file sizes. Uh, you saw this morning um, yeah, the file na name and the file size is there. That field for large file support is obviously larger. And Yeah. Is this maybe related to USB as a USB device? Mm. I, I, I really don't know. Uh, the only thing we can try and do is to simulate the same thing, but then, for example, just do a, a sort of copy to the drive in such a way that it can shut down. And if it comes back up later and the, the uh, WPS, I was going to say WPI, the WPS crashes, then you know it's nothing to do with my program. Not that that's a problem for me, but then we isolate where the problem is. Your program finishes the task, connected, and after five or six minutes, the, okay. the terminal USB drive is going to okay. roll and after uh, clicking on the drive, yeah. on the icon again, Okay, but my program is closed and is okay. It's still open. Well, try closing my program and see what happens because that. But like Greg showed this morning, sometimes things interact. Any other questions? Well, I do know that um, I had problems. Oh, it doesn't like doing that, does it? <laughs> this is uh, trying to get the pro. Ah, oh, it's coming back. Yes, sure. Uh, not in the program, but I've indicated in the help file there is a, um, a number of um, uh, sort of cron utilities. There is a very nice one, I think, um, uh, your, uh, what's his name? Um, yeah, cron, no, but I was thinking of your, Richard, it was Richard Walsh. Uh, but there's one where uh, that's, uh, I've, I've got it in the documentation, documentation somewhere, and that is integrated into the workplace shell such that you have on one of the extra tab pages, you can set a time when something should run. So you can use that. So I said, uh, yeah. Okay. So, but there are various other um, programs available. I didn't put it into this program because why reinvent the wheel? There are other good programs there.
Next question. Before everyone starts snoring. And then it can run fully unattended. Yes, run. yes. You see, you, you can put, the, the easiest way is then to, to start it with a script. You can do that also from the command line. Uh, if you start it with a script and you set in the script, well, always close everything afterwards, yeah. then it will close it. The only thing you have to do, of course, is to look in the log and see if there are any errors. Or you say, don't close it if there is an error. But the sort of errors that occur are if you're really doing strange things, like on both devices, you are updating, and he doesn't really know, should I take the, the latest version or not? Because is it the latest version? But you can change the action in the automatic table. So whatever you want. Yes? Yes, yes. You, you can start it from a command line okay. and you say uh, there's a, a slash D option, which is a debugging mode, which I use sometimes. And there's a, a, another slash option, which I think it's slash S, which starts the script file. Or you don't even have to write a slash S, you just write the script file. May, may I please suggest, since everybody started to cave in a bit, I don't know why, but the, um, the, the catering has removed the coffee and the tea, but there are now jugs of cold water there. So okay. it's a quarter past two. No. Oh, I'm so running out of time. You're out of time, yes. So. <laughs> Any other questions? Please approach me privately with money in your hand. <laughs> anyway, I hope I've uh, told you a little bit, and thank you. <laughs>